first part of that was to unify quantum mechanics with Einstein's theory of special relativity. Remember, special relativity is Einstein's theory where he modified Newton's laws of motion to agree with the fact that light always travels in the same velocity regardless of how it's created. It turned out that in combining quantum mechanics with special relativity can be done, but it led to a marvelous and very surprising new world. A lot of the original work was done by Paul Dirac, the famous British physicist, and he invented a new equation for the electron, which was a relativistic equation. Unlike the earlier, um, the first form of the quantum equation for the electron, Dirac invented a relativistic equation, but had a very funny property that was tied to deep facts about relativity. It predicted the existence of antimatter. And again, there was a nice coincidence that technology advanced in such a way that the existence of antimatter could be tested experimentally pretty soon after Dirac had um, predicted it. It was originally discovered in cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are rays that come to us from space. Even today, 80 years later, how they're created isn't completely understood. Many low-energy cosmic rays, for example, are created by the sun, but at very high energies. We still don't know where cosmic rays come from. Anyway, though, Scientists taking um, photographic plates used to detect cosmic rays up to mountaintops, they discovered that not only were there ordinary electrons, but also there were antimatter electrons or positrons in the cosmic rays. The positrons are just like electrons in terms of their mass, but they have the opposite sign of the electric charge. And they have the amazing property that when an electron meets a positron, they annihilate into pure radiation into electromagnetic waves. The point of quantum field theory, in a sense, is that it taught us that matter, antimatter, and radiation are all different ways of looking at the same thing. Matter and antimatter can combine into radiation. Radiation can uh, combine into matter and antimatter. And it's all described by a system of relativistic equations that's far more unified than anything that anyone had had before. There's something that people who aren't physicists usually tend to not understand about modern physics. Because of Einstein's great fame and the fact that his work was on a much deeper plane than anything that had come before, people tend to assume that the most difficult theory that physicists grapple with is Einstein's work. But actually, it's not true. Since quantum theory, and especially since the work of Dirac on relativistic quantum theory, the most difficult theory in modern physics by far is quantum field theory. It's an extremely difficult subject. Well, it was the work of most of the 20th century to understand it better. We're still understanding it better, but you could say that the modern understanding took half a century from Dirac until what's called asymptotic freedom, a pivotal discovery made in the 70s that made it possible to understand the atomic nucleus. A whole chain of Nobel Prizes went into understanding quantum field theory, which was the theory by which physicists combined quantum mechanics with special relativity. Not with Einstein's general relativity, only with his simpler theory of special relativity. The point we've reached in the story so far is the success physicists had in combining quantum mechanics with Einstein's first theory, special relativity, that describes how light has the same velocity regardless of how it's created. Of course, people wanted to go on and combine quantum mechanics with Einstein's deeper theory of general relativity, his theory of gravity. But as first became clear in the 1930s, that actually didn't work, at least not in any straightforward way. If one tries to apply the quantum principles to general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity, one runs into a web of contradictions. One finds that the nonlinear mathematics that Einstein needed for general relativity simply doesn't work well in the context of quantum theory. In a way, it has to do with the old problem of the electron spiraling into the atomic nucleus. Physicists grappled with that problem in different ways throughout the 20th century. So quantum theory without relativity solved it. 
then when they included special relativity, the problem actually got worse again. And it took another 20 years, and it actually wasn't completed until about 1950, leading to the Nobel Prize of Feynman, Schwinger, and Tomonaga, when the problem of the electron spiraling into the nucleus was solved in special relativistic quantum theory. But in general relativistic quantum theory, where you worry about the electron spiraling into the atomic nucleus because of gravitational forces, all this still didn't work. And the, as far as we understand today, and of course we don't know everything, but our best understanding today is that general relativity in ordinary four-dimensional space-time, I remember it's four-dimensional because Einstein taught us to count the time as well as the three obvious space dimensions. Our best understanding today is that general relativity in quantum theory just doesn't work. Something needs to be modified. I fisici di tutto il mondo tentano da decenni di elaborare una teoria in grado di descrivere l'universo in tutte le sue dimensioni, unificando i risultati della relatività generale e della meccanica quantistica. A partire dagli anni 50, l'attenzione degli scienziati si concentra sullo zoo di particelle elementari messo in luce dagli esperimenti condotti al CERN di Ginevra. Ha così inizio la ricerca di principi in grado di descrivere le leggi fondamentali della natura a partire dai suoi costituenti elementari. Il ricercatore Gabriele Veneziano compie il primo passo nel 1968 quando trova una formula in grado di descrivere le proprietà di buona parte delle particelle rilevate. A partire dalle sue ricerche, i fisici Yoichiro Nambu Olger Nielsen e Leonard Suskin propongono per queste particelle il modello di piccole stringhe. Ne emerge una nuova teoria che prende proprio il nome di teoria delle stringhe e che appare a molti la candidata più promettente per svolgere la funzione di teoria unificante. Alla sua base vi è l'ipotesi che le particelle non siano puntiformi ma siano costituite da un minuscolo filamento, detto stringa, che vibra e oscilla, determinando, a seconda del modo in cui avviene la vibrazione, le caratteristiche fondamentali di tutte le particelle, la massa e la carica. Ma in che modo la sostituzione di una particella puntiforme con una stringa può risolvere il problema dell'unificazione tra la meccanica quantistica e la relatività generale? Nel 1974 i fisici John Schwartz e Joel Scherk avanzano l'ipotesi che uno dei modi in cui una stringa oscilla corrisponda perfettamente alle proprietà del gravitone, la particella mediatrice della forza gravitazionale. Questo confermerebbe che la teoria delle stringhe è in grado di collegare la gravità descritta dalla relatività generale con la struttura delle particelle descritta dalla meccanica quantistica. La natura di questa nuova teoria è però talmente rivoluzionaria e ambiziosa che finora non ha condotto a risultati sperimentali. Sarà necessario molto lavoro prima di poterla considerare compiuta, ma nel frattempo si candida a diventare un'unica e onnicomprensiva teoria del tutto. So in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, of course, physicists wanted to reconcile quantum mechanics with Einstein's general relativity, but there weren't any ideas worth remembering, really. But in the meantime, other things were happening, because the particle accelerators were invented and became important starting in the 1950s, and a wealth of new things were discovered. There were new particles and new forces and new phenomena, like a f what we call parity violation, a fundamental asymmetry of nature between left and right, 
where the laws of nature just don't look the same if you look in a mirror, a lot of very strange things were discovered. And the focus of trying to understand the fundamental laws of nature shifted in the 50s and 60s away from questions like trying to understand gravity and more toward trying to understand the elementary particles. But the continuation of our story involves an idea that developed in the 1960s, which from a modern point of view was possibly only half correct the way it was originally interpreted, but it turned out to be the seed of many wonderful later discoveries. A lot of it had to do with the work of Italian physicists, actually, including Regge, Veneziano, Fubini, Virasoro, and too many for me to mention in full detail here. But there was the experimental discovery that there were more and more strongly interacting particles as we increased the energy at the particle accelerators. And then there was an idea that sprang from work of Regge that these particles should be put in what are called Regge trajectories, that many different particles, in some sense, are different forms of the same thing. And then there were ideas that people had about writing some kind of a fundamental equation that would describe all this mess. And the properties that people wanted looked impossible. Some very distinguished physicists were very close to writing papers saying it was impossible, when then Gabriele Veneziano found a way to actually do it. That was his famous paper, written in 1968, where he gave a formula with wonderful properties that qualitatively looked like it was a lot like the world of the strongly interacting particles. Well, it only described half of the strongly interacting particles, and we'll discuss the other half later on. But for half of the particles, perhaps not the ones you've most heard about. Most people will know about protons and neutrons. Veneziano's original work had more to do with particles you may know about less, like pions and rho mesons. But in my line of work, if you're interested in the fundamental laws of nature, the pions and the rho mesons are as important as the protons and neutrons. And Veneziano had an amazing formula that describes some of their properties. And as physicists worked harder on understanding what the Veneziano formula meant, they discovered more and more amazing things. This unfolded over a period of perhaps five years, from about 1968 to 1973, when there was very intensive work on the subject. It culminated in the understanding that um, although um, Veneziano had no inkling of this when he first wrote down his formula. The Veneziano formula is best understood as an equation describing the behavior of little strings, little loops of string in space. So the idea going back to Reggie had been that different particles were different forms of something. Well, in the Veneziano model, what they're different forms of is different states of vibration of a string. Just like a piano string can vibrate in different shapes or harmonics, leading to a fundamental tone and its higher overtones, which are responsible for the beauty of music. In the context of the Veneziano model, the pion, the rho meson, the omega, the phi, and various other things that perhaps will be less familiar, are different states of vibration of one basic string.